There we are. Welcome, everybody, to this panel on businesses championing social change. We are very happy to see all of you who joined us this afternoon in Europe and morning in the United States of America. is definitely something that the world needs a perspective on. We have the UK present in the room with us in the panel. We have Iceland, we have Spain, we have the United States of America, and then we have Denmark. And we are all here to give our five cents on what it takes for business to actually drive social change and whether it's possible even to expect of businesses to be the global forces for more a more fair world, a more equal world. So this is what we are going to discuss in this panel today. And uh, with me, I have Svana Gunnistodier, who is the founding partner of uh, Froome Track Ventures. Can you say hi, Svana, so you, we know it's you? Welcome. We have Kevin McGovern, who is the founder of McGovern Capital in the USA. We have Tina Woods, who is a social entrepreneur and the founding partner and director of Business for Health. And then we have Antonio, and excuse me if I don't say your last name right, but it's Cantala Pietra, is that correct? Yeah, yeah that's, um, that's Chief Executive Officer of Wuniverse. Welcome to all of you esteemed panelists today. I would like to just ask each of you briefly give a short introduction to the topic and why you're excited about being in the panel today and talking about this from your heart and also maybe a few opening points about what you would like to really get covered in the webinar today. So why don't we start with you, Antonio? Okay, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. It's a, it's a, it's a pleasure to be um, talking about this, uh, I think this relevant topic, business championing social change, because many times we, we think that uh, only topics um, clearly related to, to business or, or uh, mathematics or financials or KPIs or, or, or nowadays machine learning, big data, you know, and, and these kind of uh, things are, are, are important and relevant or the, or, or the EBITDA or the EBIT, these kind of parameters. But, uh, but I think it's uh, especially after the pandemic, you know, uh, it's clear that we need to we need to really uh, reshape uh, the way we think, uh, the way we connect business with society, and 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 uh, and there is an urgency uh, for for leaders to inspire and to generate and to execute change, and that's why I think uh, it, it's important to 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 be um, um, you know uh, talking about this uh, this uh, this matter. And uh, I'll try to, to make, make the contribution. So uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I, I was the co-founder of, uh, of uh, My Taxi. Now it's, it's called uh, Free Now in, in Europe. It's kind of a, the, the Uber of, of, of Europe. We sold the company to Mercedes-Benz and actually I'm leading a fintech uh, company. Uh, and previously I was, I was working as a, as a top uh, executive for BlackBerry. So long time ago it sounds long time ago but uh, it was it was uh, uh during the last decade and and well nothing more than that uh, i'll try to to uh to explain how to generate social change thank you antonio and svana what's uh, what's your story why are you excited about being in this panel today and uh, Yes, I am. I am very excited about this panel because I find that the timing is absolutely right now. I mean, it's been for a long time, but the awareness is uh, there, and uh, I want to be part of, uh, you know, enforcing the awareness around uh, the world. Uh, my, yeah, my name is Svana. I'm basically entrepreneur by heart, so a little bit like Antonio. I have also a background in, in startup businesses. Not as big uh, success as he was, uh, but enough to uh, go into the VC world uh, and start a VC fund. And our focus is on uh, tech companies. We are in Iceland, so I really believe in the brain power. And that's something that we should export. And we have a, a focus on 
um, um, responsible investments. And it's very interesting to see that our LPs are now also requesting, you know, a responsible investment strategy for the funds. So I think it's uh, the impact coming also from the investment side. So the companies, you know, will also not get money unless so it holds hand in hand. So um, and I'm really interested and I think investors can really drive because you meant the drive of social change. Uh, we can also do it uh, in the startup community from the beginning. So I would like to discuss that. Awesome. So we're looking forward to that. So we have the startup perspective. We have the VC perspective. And then there's you, Kevin. You're sitting in the United States of America in Miami, as I understand it. Correct? This morning? Yeah, it's about 81 degrees, as I told you. So uh, we're doing fine. McGovern Capital is a single family office. Uh, we've been dedicated to doing the type of things we're talking about for a long, long time. I also teach at Cornell and I lecture at other universities around the world. Just spoke at Calist about a month ago in Saudi Arabia and Stanford. Long story short, my first day at class and, and the theme of what we do is I say the purpose of companies, in my opinion, in our opinion, is to build values, build values for investors. Sure. Build values for your employees, build values for your community and build values for your world. I don't think it's simply an opportunity. I think it's a responsibility. And, you know, I do find it curious. I, I spoke at Clubhouse, which is an amazing thing right now. And, and he was sort of talking. I'm not saying it was in any way inaccurate, like ESG, et cetera, is a new phenomenon. I go back to Clay Christensen at Harvard when he talked about disruptive technologies in the late 90s. And I'm proud to say that I was a partner with Stu Hart, uh, who wrote with C.K. Prowlid to me, the formulative article, The Fortune to be Made at the Bottom of the Pyramid. And that was in early 2000s. What I'm trying to say is not necessarily that there's anything wrong with what's happening now. Thank God it's happening. It's good. And as Antonio said, it's very timely with COVID, et cetera. But this is something that we've been trying to get done for a long time. And as we progress in our conversation, there's ways of doing it better than we're doing now, in my opinion. And we'll get to that. But basically, that's, that's really important to us. And all of our companies try to do good and make money. We're involved in cures for vascular diseases. We're involved. We want to be the largest uh, supplier to plant-based foods in the world. And we've made a lot of progress in that area. We work a great deal in medical cannabis. And my personal favorite of all is clean water. And we created the Pure Filter for Procter & Gamble. But most of all, we work on filters, water filters around the world because we believe other than COVID, the biggest health issue in the world is clean water and waterborne diseases. So that's really important. So social change, impact, a responsibility, not an opportunity, both. Thank you, Kevin. And then we have you, Tina, based off of the UK. And why are you excited about speaking? Yeah, well, well, first of all, Kevin has brought me a little bit back down memory lane a little bit because Cornell is my alma mater many, many years ago when I wow. studied as a pre-med student, um, uh, but it also reminded me, talking about ESG and how this has been uh, here for a while, I mean, I remember eating Ben & Jerry's ice cream in Ben & Jerry's first shop, which was in a fire station, I think in Burlington, Vermont, and that was a really long time ago. Um, and of course, they're one of the first companies that be, you know, to start the whole B Corp and, and that whole sort of uh, um, uh, thing that we see now. But uh, so, uh, so yeah, so and the reason why I'm so excited today, I mean, I'm a bit of a, I've always been quite entrepreneurial. I've worked for a large part of my life in the commercial sector. Um, but more recently, I guess in my sort of, in my middle age, so to speak, I decided that uh, I had this calling, you know, this calling as a social entrepreneur. So I'm a bit of a serial social entrepreneur now. Um, but actually what I'm really excited about is business in context, working with many, many other stakeholders. And I'm very, very involved in health. But of course now post COVID, you know, we're seeing how intricately linked health and wealth is. And, um, what a big issue we have with, and of course, COVID has completely um, sort of uh, exposed this in, in, in quite, in, in a pretty uh, drastic way. I mean, how 
social inequalities are so linked um, with health inequalities. So it's a really, really big issue that we need to crack. So wearing a few of my hats, uh, and of course, uh, today I'm, I'm acting in the capacity of having just launched um, a social enterprise called Business for Health, which is all about sort of building back better. It's about in the business community, what more, how, how we can incentivize and encourage business to do more, to contribute to, uh, to health, you know, sustainable long-term changes in health, but also to call out sort of negative practices in health. Um, so, uh, so that's something that's new, um, but and it came actually. Out, it was a recommendation out of some other work that I've been doing and wearing my other hat, which is running the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Longevity, which is chaired by our former Deputy Prime Minister Damien Green. And working with other very influential parliamentarians, we 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 um, launched a, a Health of the Nation strategy last year, just before COVID hit. And of course, we were looking at a government goal of five extra years of healthy life expectancy while minimizing health inequality. So it was a mission that was set by government. We tried to come up and we did. We launched our strategy to achieve that mission. COVID hit. And then, of course, we saw that as the data was coming out, how our most vulnerable communities were hardest hit by COVID. We realized that our recommendations were, were even more urgent and compelling. And so while government and the NHS, our public health system, were heads down in crisis and were only just emerging now, what we did is we looked at... Um, the Business for Health Coalition, which was one of our recommendations. And indeed, throughout last year, we set it up. So we launched effectively four months ago. So we have the backing of the business community. We're right in the middle of uh, planning um, uh, the, 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 the process by which we will develop a business index. How do we measure the business contribution to health of our nation? So we're taking some learnings from other indices around the world. We've got um, countries like New Zealand who measure the success of their nation through the well-being index rather than just uh, necessarily just GDP, which, of course, how many nations uh, measure it. So we're and we're taking a real steer from the climate change agenda, you know, looking at the four different roles of business, business as an employer, as an innovator, producer and um, supplier of products and services, and also as a buyer. So taking learnings from really what has worked really, really well in the, in the climate change space and trying to bring that into the health space, which is basically 10 years behind. I'll stop there, but, um, but it's been quite a journey. Wow. So we're going to come back to your story in a little while, uh, Tina, but I'm just going to uh, bring it back to you, Kevin, and ask you, because you've been in the game for a long time and you're also all over the world. So I'm curious to hear... Do you see any differences between uh, companies in the U.S. or Europe or Asia or, or South America when it comes to taking that responsibility you were talking about you see is happening and that people would like to actually be responsible and behave responsibly? Is, isn't there any uh, differences depending on where you look in the world or is it all the same? What are you saying? No, it's, it's, it's a patchwork. <clears throat> My experience frankly, is America companies do wonderful things, but frankly, European companies seem to get social impact message and, and, and responsibility a little bit more. Asia has a lot to catch up on, in, in my opinion. I do want to say, though, a, a couple of years ago, I was a keynote at another family office conference. And, you know, we're sort of, our, our motto internally is catch the current and make the wave. So we like to set trends. And I spoke about, you know, the impact community. And I said, you know, it's wonderful what Tina, you're doing in terms of measuring uh, different impact com companies, because I think it's really, really important. And I'll tell you one story that really I think is very important. I, I, I went years ago in my clean water efforts to a company that had gotten some money from the Gates Foundation. And I said to the, to the owner, who remained nameless, of course, and it was an NGO. I said, you know, you have a five-year study for, for the Gates we can get that done in six months where we've been doing point of use water for a long time. And I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, we have a five year contract. It's going to take us five years to do it. So I want to say this is that the responsibility to govern ourselves is not just to say how we're going to move forward. It's to make sure that we identify those who are most effective, who are bringing that money really into the field. And when you're talking to wealthy people, what I say to them is spend as much money on the due diligence on your impact exercises as you do on entrepreneurs like me. Because sending somebody out in the field for, you know, 5,000 bucks or something and giving 5 million is nothing. Make sure it's being done there. And as I said, I think European countries spend a lot more dedicated to that, spending time in some of the more uh, desperate places and a lot of others 
talk too much and don't put it into action. I like people who walk. And my last expression from a dear friend who was uh, honorary chairman of my water company, and I'm not naming a name, but it's Quincy Jones. He says, you got to go to know. So we can be Zooming all we want, but when we're looking around the world, we've got to go to know. So is that a matter of measuring? Do we have the right uh, parameters to actually judge when we can't go? And what does it look like from your perspective, Svana, sitting in another part of the world, looking into all of this? Well, I think basically the, the biggest challenge also for the companies is actually how, what, you know, where to start, what to do, how to measure Are they doing the right thing? I mean, it's also about educating yourself. You know, there's a lot of uh, information out there. So I think that's definitely a challenge. But now we see, um, you know, like the, uh, the sustainable development goals of the United Nations that gives a specific framework and uh, guidelines which you can apply and use. So I think and also, I mean, coming from the investment side, There's the principles for responsible investment. So also, and we try to educate our companies and help. So we we are just in starting this. So we are not that far, but we aim to do this very well with our companies. So yeah, it remains to be seen. And and why did you choose to do that, Svana? What was your incentive? I mean, this is my purpose of investing. I mean, it should make a difference. I mean, it should do something good. Wow. So. Yeah, so, I mean, otherwise you should just not do it, in my opinion. Yeah, so, so is, there, is there an incentive? I'm curious to hear because, Kevin, you also mentioned investors first and then you mentioned employers and, of course, the planet and societies. Is that a prioritized order when you look at it from the investment side or is it just a coincidence you mentioned it in this order? And have you seen a historical difference between who you put first when you think about investment. Definitely. The identification of change agents, which is what we call the people we invest in, the identification of them has really advanced and people are far more knowledgeable. You know, my two qualities, I, I hear about persistence. I think those are wussy words. Real entrepreneurs, they have courage and they have commitment. And, you know, basically entrepreneurs face negativity almost every day. Positivity is like once a week. Those who have the courage to really do it. And I, I, I keep saying we look for people who have the courage and have expressed the courage to get it done. Second of all, and last, I won't take too much time, is we just don't like I people. We like we people. And we, we, it, when, we, when we go for a first interview and I hear somebody, I'm sorry I have to use I a little bit today. I hate that word. And anybody who works with me would know that. I hate the word I. I love the word we, and I hate the word they. I don't hate the word they, but I like the word us. And you're looking always for people. And again, it's not just the team. It's how we impact our mankind and how we, I think over the long haul, being an older person than anybody here right now, the companies that have done the most good have been the most successful in the long haul. And we've seen that, of good to great, et cetera. Books have been written about it. So forgive me, I don't mean to take too much time. No, it's very valid. And I think you're touching on something that Antonio also would like to talk a little bit about because it's uh, it's also a matter of when it starts in the minds of entrepreneurs or does it start in corporates who have been around for a long time? Can we can we actually expect of everybody to have this mindset that it's a good idea, it's good for business and it's good for the planet and societies that we think this way? Or do we need to nurture this at another stage? So, Antonio, what's uh, what's your perspective on this? Okay, I think I, th I remember when we um, when we uh, founded uh, My Taxi uh, in 2000, 2009. So. Uh, um it, it was it was uh, also a storytelling about how to uh beyond the product right so connecting the taxi drivers with the with the with the users uh with the people in motion it wasn't a storytelling that uh, we wanted to to um to change uh the way of life in in in, in big cities right so because uh, more than Uh, 10 million people are still dying every every year by pollution. Uh, also, the, the you know the, the you know the noise. It's uh, it's really bad for the heart attacks, etc. And it's causing a stress, etc. So 
behind that was a storytelling and, 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 and a purpose uh, with a lot of values, you know, all together, um, you know, to, to change uh, mobility in cities. And now with Buniverse, the same. We are paperless solution. We're trying to cut down on bureaucracy because it's, it's another illness of, of, of many uh, countries and, and, and making, wasting people's lives. But yeah, um, at, at that moment, I don't think investors were kind of uh, uh, thinking about this. Uh, okay, and, and they respected uh, this uh, storytelling around the time because we were also giving them uh, GMB uh, bookings, tours, you know, and the company was really looking up. After the pandemic, I see, uh, I don't want to think it's it's just marketing as, as it was in the past. Probably now things are, are, are things are changing a little bit. But one of the things uh, I, I, I ever thought, especially now because in Spain, Spain Um, you know, for for uh, for fintech companies, and we need to we need to come out with a sandbox culture. I think one of the best ways to generate uh, a, a culture of of uh, values, sacred values, engagement that allows people's skills and personalities to shine uh, through is to enable what I call a, a sandbox sandbox culture. I don't think it, this is this comes and this is. is Familiar for everybody, but in tech, the tech industry, a sandbox mode allows a player to enter an open play mode and enjoy the game uh, with free reign many times without certain objectives or rules, but still within the confines of, of the of the tech parameters. And I think this is uh, this is necessary since uh, every single uh, uh, for for every for every kid, you know, for for for, for the children. Because I think it establishes a solid and successful framework, uh, establishing a framework uh, with solid core values, vision, and brand identity, uh, and this will make you know the contributions and the and the and and, uh, and the creativity to shine and to grow within societies. I think it's it's necessary, uh, you know, to generate this since uh, since people is is, is really uh, you know a kid. So what you're actually saying is that by instilling this mindset or this way of looking at businesses from very early age might help. But I'm curious to hear, Tina, your perspective from working both on with governments and the governmental level and then also the entrepreneurship and their foundation that you've actually also been starting up. How does those three um, sides of business actually Uh, pile up and how do they help each other do they do they have like a responsibility to build on each other and and what's your experience here so so I, i'll pick up i mean so a couple of the key words so so um uh kevin mentioned sort of the we um and antonio mentioned and talked about sandboxes so so what i'm really and and also purpose and mission so a lot of what i do um with hardly any team no resources no money You know, hardly, you know, I'm always sort of scrabbling around to get things done and actioned. Um, but what I find what has been a, the key to the success of actually getting big changes through is, you know, this whole collaboration piece, this mission driven sort of collaboration, because uh, that's how you can get people from very, very disparate perspectives, very, very different groups together and to work together around a collective goal and a co collective vision. And uh, so it's, a nor it's, it's incredible what you can actually achieve with uh, by getting people together who all have experiences, networks, knowledge, expertise, resources, and you can do big, big things. So I think, uh, so a lot of the work that I do is about building these sort of ecosystems, you know, and of course, I'm very, very involved in the tech sector and I'm hugely inspired and work a lot with the, you know, the tech ecosystem and startup community, who of course have a lot of ideas, you know, often don't have, you know, a lot of resources, capital, all that sort of stuff. But, you know, if you, if you bring people together, if you've got policymakers, you know, big business, you know, small agile entrepreneurs with public sector policymakers around 
a goal. It is extraordinary what you can do. I mean, it's, you know, this is how we did our health the nation strategy. We're now trying to do that with our business for health, you know, collective, um, you know, to do big things. Uh, so I think, you know, we call it different things. We call it, you know, uh, responsible capitalism, multi-stakeholder capitalism. We talk about, you know, all sorts of different sort of capitalisms. I do, I do think, you know, the general public, especially coming out of COVID, are expecting different things from our from our stakeholders, including the business community. So, um, so I think working together and I think supporting, and I'm very, very interested actually in, in, in supporting sort of local and regional clusters, because I think that's the other big thing that's coming out. And this is, again, where business, whether you're big or small, and of course, the growing role of social enterprise, because I'm looking at that I'm um, doing a big piece of work actually with UK research and innovation right now, looking at how we can support social enterprise, who, of course, by definition, tend to be more local, community driven. They, they're, they're inspired by the needs in their communities. And I think that's a really, really big lesson of COVID is how can we get communities, get that civic action, getting local business, getting these clusters to really, really improve you know, local areas, health of, you know, so I think there's some really, really interesting lessons. I, I know Horasis is a global community, but I think we really have to also look at how we can mobilize the grassroots and see the change coming from that. Uh, so I think that's a really interesting piece. And it, again, it comes back down to this concept of having a clear purpose, a, a mission, you know, whether it's regional, local, you know, for, you know, it may be set at a, at a much higher level. And this is where SDG and all that is very, very helpful. Um, but it all needs to come together around what is good for us as a as humanity, as, as a society, you know, that we all want to do. Um, and I think that's where COVID has been so instrumental is actually really that sense of urgency and collective purpose, which is really important now. So, Kevin, when you look at it from your perspective and uh, you talked about walking the talk and, and being there on the ground to actually really assess what's going on. Do you have any specific things you look for on the paper, you know, before you actually go see for yourself whether then people actually do what they say they do? And what is it then that you're looking for? Well, the first thing you do is look at the management, see how much they've been walking as opposed to talking. And often when you interview them, talk with them, whatever, you'll find out how much field work they've done. And I think that's a real important factor is how much how much field work have you done? I know it's very difficult right now for all of us with the Zoom era that we're in. But as we return and, and to some extent, we're going to have to put our foot in the water to keep this momentum going. But Tina, you know, and Antonio and all of us, the one thing that I find is lacking tremendously is leadership and that's really easy to say and and I don't want to sound cynical I'm not cynical you know the UN goals and all that and and even CDC and WHO etc we just don't have worldwide organizations that people are are gathering around and we need it badly and we Americans need to do more of that I got it you know we can we can talk about Europe making advances, et cetera. It doesn't matter what we negatively say about each other. It's it's our planet. And we're just not leading the charge by, by bringing in different ideas. You know, what I find right now in the world that's really bothering me personally is the, the quelching of ideas, the quelching of communication. And if you don't think my way, I don't want to listen to you. That's not the way we've learned the world has developed over the last, you know, I've, I've witnessed the last X amount of years. The advances are made by having multidisciplinary and multi-intellectual people coming together and saying we have a common cause. And despite our differences, let's find out what, what we have in common to accomplish. And we all know I could rattle that off and spend a lot of time, but that's the reason everybody's on this call, whether it's environmental and by the way, water, water, water is my my passion. But all of that needs desperately leadership by action and, and joining everybody together. And Tina, you talked about the word collaboration. I couldn't agree with you more. We have to bring in, but not just like minds. Please, folks, we got to find, you know, separate minds and bring them in and say, how do we find a common cause? Right, Antonio? Okay. Yes, I, I just want to jump in there because I totally agree with you. I mean, this is just some framework, which is that uh, anyway, there's no push from it, uh, no, no, uh, you know, legal requirements to follow anything. So I, I actually think that the real push will come from the consumers, from the people. 
they will do business with companies that are making difference. And like Antonio, you spoke about, and that's so true, they, this was used for marketing purposes before. And companies that will do that will be, you know, it will be their bad. They will be called out on it. So I think it will not, we will never, I think it's a, it's a, a wishful thinking to get a leadership top down, but definitely the consumer, we will change it by our behavior and our changes. That's what I believe. So Svana, if you could just maybe continue talking a little bit about how you assess or uh, what you look for when you invest in, in the small startup world in coming out of Iceland, but then growing big and, and for hopefully going global. Uh, so is your perspective the same as Kevin's or is what, what are you looking for? I totally second that. And I think uh, this is all about people. So what we think uh, when we do investment is the management and the people driving it, that we share the same values and our view on the world. So that's the first step. And then it's another one to follow it and see that you are going through what you're saying. So basically, I totally agree with what Kevin was saying, and that's how we do it as well. Yeah. So, Tina, how did you make that collaboration happen? <laughs> that's my secret sauce. No, just teasing. No, I, I, do you know, it's about... It's about finding, I mean, it's amazing when you get a collection of people together who want to do something and then you can just do it. Uh, so I think, you know, with all the things, if I think back, you know, for example, how we even started, you know, the um, all party parliamentary group, you know, that came from just wanting to do something, getting people around a table and then deciding to do it. And then, of course, you work through your relationships, your networks, you build you build a sort of a group of, of people who want to affect the change. And then and of course, you have to choose wisely. You have to choose those who have the influence, who've got the ideas. You know, you have to get the right ensemble who are really, really going to drive this through. So, of course, there's a there's an art to that. Um, and, you know, and then, of course, you know, like anything, you know, to, there is always, you know, you use other sort of strategies like the fear of missing out when you've got this thing that's going to that's that's starting, that's bubbling, that's going to do big things. And everyone wants to to get involved. You know, there are all sorts of ways that you can start something. And I guess that's something that I have. That's just something that I do. But you know, starting things and getting people excited about things. But, you know, in the end, you have to have a vision, a goal that people can get behind, and then you have to be able to articulate it and then just, just make it happen. And, you know, we're not talking about needing big money. You know, we can do a lot on very, very little resources. You know, and this is where creativity and this is where the entre entrepreneurship is really, really important um, because, you know, and sniffing out the gaps, because I find a lot of this is that, you know, large organizations and, and, and I'm talking whether in commercial or public sector or in government, you know, they, you know, they're, they're, they're stuck, you know, they're, 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 they're stuck in inertia um, just because of they're too big sometimes. And of course, their performance managed in certain ways. And they often don't, and especially in an environment that's changing very quickly, and especially at a time like a pandemic. And now, of course, we've got, you know, disruption from, from all sides. In fact, the pandemic's been the biggest disruptor that no one ever predicted, except for Bill Gates, maybe a few years ago. Um, but, you know, uh, it's very, very hard for big groups to move fast. So I guess that's the that's the agility that you can have as a very small fish, which I see myself as. I'm a little little player who spots opportunities and brings the big players to to kind of do things in a way that's much more agile. And I think that's part of that's part of what you need in this environment that's changing really, really quickly. Can I add a quick note, uh, Savannah yes. and Tina? You have to show the consumer, Savannah. I agree with you 100 percent why and how it's beneficial to but Antonio I actually wanted to ask you so you're also an entrepreneur by heart and uh, you played out primarily starting out from Spain have you also seen this trend of going global with initiatives and how it can create value across borders with what you're doing What's your perspective? Well, I'm actually in Spain, but I've been in, uh, living in Germany, UK, and the United States, and, and managing businesses uh, from uh, uh, you know tons of, of, of cities, right? So um, one of the things uh, um, it's uh, I'm actually hearing from investors, for instance, is that uh, the majority of investors and in venture capitals are actually investing in in uh, um, companies that uh, that were profitable 
during the during the pandemic or even before. And I think it's it's understandable, but that that's that's not really changing anything because many companies are focusing on deep tech and and sustainable uh, products and services probably went uh, profitable during the pandemic or even before. So uh, I think um, um, you know change of heart and mind comes uh, come slow. And, and, and I don't really see a huge change uh, internally in, in, uh, within institutions. I think the majority of, of speeches are a little bit shallow, superficial. So we need to change that. We need to really change that. Otherwise, we're not going to turn this planet into sustainable, really sustainable. So is that building on what you're talking about with leadership, Kevin? And, and I'm glad we got you back here <laughs> into the game. And, and Svana, you talked about it as well. And you've talked about it, Tina. So it seems like we can all agree that we do not like this swallow, hollow, uh, nice talks about it. We like action. We like people walking the talk and actually uh, taking leadership and doing what they're actually claiming they're doing. And then we have the consumer perspective, which you talk about a lot, Svana, that it should also come from buyers and from people requesting more sustainable products and also sustainable practices in terms of taking responsibility for the mental health of people working for organizations, but also mental health in general in our society. And uh, Kevin, we lost you at a point when you were actually talking in speaking into this. Maybe you can build on that a little bit again. What were you? All I was doing is building off Savannah and Tina's comments. The consumer does not change until the consumer trusts you, believes in you, and 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 believes that there's some value in changing. You know, one of the things we learned. You know, we were part of the founding of a very successful beverage company called Sobe. And we, we created the nutraceutical industry, but we first had to gain the trust of our consumer. And then the consumer said to us, you're a change agent. We're going to follow you. But first of all, that consumer needs to feel that that this is a multifaceted effort that's going to really lead the way and have a benefit to that consumer. So I've always said, you know, we had an opportunity for water to work with a very a children's organization. I said, that's so essential. We need to train the children and teach them why this is so important and make them our change agents all over the world. I'm not saying only children, obviously, but but enlist people by making them knowledgeable. You know, talking emotionally is wonderful, but it doesn't get the job done. Talking intelligently about your subject so that the consumer understands the benefit to him and her is much more important than their call to action. Particularly, I, I said the biggest medical service in the world. You know what that is? Mom. Okay. Teach mom why this is important, et cetera, et cetera. I don't mean that's that's what I was trying to convince. No, consumer, yeah. but, but, but previously to be a, a consumer, you need to be a citizen, and that's the thing. Many of the many of the consumers right now, they're not citizens. They need to feel they're citizens, and 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 then consumers, and vice versa. You know what I mean? So that the other vice, it's, 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 it's complicated because they, they're not going to really understand there, there's something, uh, there, there's, there's, uh, there's something behind businesses beyond, you know, the, the, you know, the serve, the a convenient service or, or a cheaper service or product. There, there's something more involved. Yes, I, gotta no, say I, something. I, I don't mean to dominate, but it's really important. When we spend a lot of time in Africa, you know, people would ask us from various organizations, oh, you're for profit? Oh, oh, you're for profit? What's wrong with profit when you're benefiting all the people in your, in our companies, all of our people have a stake in the action, including the community. But this prejudice about you're for profit and we're not for profit, forget it. What are we doing to affect change? It doesn't matter whether you're for profit. There's reasons to be for profit. And sometimes it motivates people a little bit more. I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's really important. No, yeah, I totally agree with you. And I think, uh, you know, it's sad to say, but uh, in, in general, we are quite simple. I mean, people are quite simple. And change is usually not turned on unless you either feel it on yourself by pain or you're losing money or it hurts you, you know, in any way. That's the trigger. 
you know of course we will have a certain very small uh, group of people that will proactively change the behavior that's just how we are we don't change unless we see our house is burning you know so is that's our ever, challenge is there ever a, a, um, an instance where you would not invest svana or kevin because you see that companies do not follow on your um, either in Uh, inspiration or what you would like them to do or do you tell them to change or, or how does that work hire slowly fire quickly invest slowly <laughs> don't be impetuous meet with the people several times I love I don't love I, I when people don't give you the same facts and figures that no way do we want to invest people oh. who are consistent so many people will talk all the sizzle and really not know the substance So, you know, we we're slower than most, maybe. Okay. That's the way it is. But once we're in, we don't give up. All we right. stay, we stay. We got the right people, we stay with them. I'm proud to say we have a much higher rate of success because we stay with the right people and find the, the solution that works a little Darwinian here and there. But when people are inconsistent, that's a bad sign. Okay. Thank you. We are about to sum up now. We have a little less than five minutes back. And so I would like for each of you to just uh, make a final comment, something you maybe learned in this uh, panel for the last hour we spoke, uh, something you heard the others say, something you would like to just end with uh, for people to remember. So, um, Antonio, why don't you go first? Um, so... Um So um, I insist. I think that for sure we need to deal with uh, with grown ups for sure, but uh, but we need to start out, you know, with with uh, you know uh, spreading values, sacred values to to young people. Because one of the things we are actually um, seeing with millennials is that they they uh, they don't really have sacred values. So and, and and they want to they want to live quick, uh, doing whatever they want, and, and they don't think in you know in in the next generations. So and it, something something went, went wrong. Uh, uh, so we need to really you know reestablish sacred values, you know, and also to foster uh, probably not in the states but in enthusiastically. Uh, improve the the access to to creativity to innovation. That's why I I, I talked about the sandbox culture since the very first moment, since they are kids, you know, and focusing on solutions to save the planet, to make the planet sustainable, etc. And it can be profitable as well, for sure. Thank you, Antonio and Tina. What your closing remarks? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that bringing everything back to the, the citizen, I think, is really, really important. I completely agree with everything that's been said. So I think, um, so I think, you know, from where I'm sitting, I, I'm not so sure. I mean, I've got three three sons between the ages of 19 to 23, and I, I, I mean, I, I think they have great worries over the future. I think, you know, that generation is seriously worried about, you know, the planet, you know, all these sorts of things. I think COVID has really has really thrust a huge spotlight on just the unfairness of things and that we must take stock and we must learn from that and and try and do more as citizens, you know, for our fellow man. Um, uh, so I think, you know, that's something that we must use as part of the change that we need to see. So I do think there's a greater consciousness in the business community. And I think there's been a lot of businesses, you know, pretty, pretty, you know, a lot have, have stepped up to the plate in terms of what citizens and communities expect, you know, of, Of, of their of their communities of businesses etc so I just think you know let's let's act fast before before it's too too late you know we, we need to ride on that you know coming out of this horrible pandemic um, and 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 treat some of the good things that have come out of this pandemic you know realizing that the deep-rooted inequalities that do exist in large parts of the world really really are going to drive all of us down so you know even if it's self-protectionism let's just you know let's just you know grapple with that reality um, yeah. just deal with give the word also to Kevin and Svana before we close up. It's uh, two minutes left. So you go first, please. Kevin, Kevin, let me hear your closing I'll remarks. I'll make it really short. And I, I, have it, I, I don't have the quote exactly.
not just internally, but for the world. Be that change today and use the, use those examples in your community and spread it to the world. Yeah, I, I actually have a dream because Iceland is small enough uh, that we could actually, you know, be the front seat and lead by example. And I have added secret, uh, you know, sacred values to it and a sandbox. Uh, we could be that uh, uh, lead by that and uh, I think we could very you know we could do that if we want to you know and uh, yes so this was very very interesting we could have talked for hours I'm sure and learned from each other's perspectives and that's actually what this whole panel was about uh, talking about the holistic views seeing it from different parts of the world the startup community the founder mentality the uh, investor perspective, their small startups, their larger corporations. So thank you so much for your time and energy in this panel today. And thank you to everyone who listened along. Have a great rest of your day and conference and see you later. Thanks, Penel. <laughs> thank you.